are you supposed to do afterwards? Check it well, okay. sure. That's right. And it is because you check what I say against the very word of God to see whether what I'm saying to you is truth or whether it's error. That is not happening within the churches today. In churches today, people have said, we will be more than happy to listen to what you say and accept that and get on with our lives. Okay? Paul laid a foundation for what true salvation is, and that true salvation is based on Jesus Christ and Him alone. This is why I told you from the beginning that if you only had one book in the Bible, and it was the book of 1 Peter, you have everything in there that you would need for salvation. Because Peter says, plainly, as Ray, you pointed out, you're not redeemed with corruptible things, silver, gold, idols, anything that this earth makes or has or has been created here. You're also not redeemed by the tradition of your fathers, but you are redeemed and you are saved by one blood, and that is the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He was God's lamb that is without spot and without blemish. He is the only one that was born as a human that could stand before God and say, I deserve to be here. But why can he do that? Because he obeyed, not because he's God. Here, turn to your Bibles and let's look at Hebrews chapter 5, verses 8 through 10, and you'll get a better understanding of why I just said what I said. Jesus in his humanity could not stand before the Father and say, I deserve to be here. In his humanity, Jesus in his humanity learned how to be obedient to his Father and had to exercise faith. How does Paul say it over and over again that you're saved? You are saved by faith. The Bible says that you can't even please God unless you have what? Faith. Hebrews 5, verses 8 through 10. Verse 8 says, Though he were a son, who, who is that talking about? <laughs> Though he were a son, yet he what? <laughs> yet he learned obedience. What is that telling you about the life of Christ? <laughs> See, there are many who teach today that Jesus was able to overcome because he was God. How can he fail? If that's the case, then there really is no controversy. There really is no war. If Jesus had no way of failing, and he was only guaranteed success, don't you think he could come up with a better plan than going to the cross? Yeah. You understand what I'm saying? So, though he were a son, yet he what? He learned obedience. Brothers and sisters, this is just as important to your salvation as him dying on the cross. Because the dying of the cross and the shedding of his blood allowed you entrance into heaven. But what did that do for your life here on earth? Jesus came to show the world that you could live in complete obedience to God. And through that life, you understand? Through that life where he had to learn obedience, do we not have to do the same thing? And if he was our forerunner, if he gave us the example, are we not called for the same thing? Amen. To learn obedience the same way he did, through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, through the power of God, and through the victory that Christ has gotten for us. So though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he what? Is that just the cross? No. From the time he was born, from the time he was born to he was two years old, what is one of the great events that happened in his life? Say it out. He had to flee to Egypt. Right? Why? Because the king wanted to kill him. So from an infant, Jesus understood what it was like to be hunted, to have his life in jeopardy and peril, to know poverty, to have to be a refugee, right? 
So he, just, he didn't just take the bus down to Egypt, right? Save more than death. Yes, sir, you had your hand up? I think this goes back further. We're, we're focusing on earthly things here, dealing with suffering. I believe he suffered things in heaven before he ever came down here. Yep. The, the war that went on in heaven, he created everything. He saw things crumbling that he had created and starting to decay even before this birth. He learned that obedience in heaven before he ever came to earth. And what he's talking about, can you imagine actually having a war break out in heaven? It says that Michael and his angels fought. Who's Michael? Jesus. So Jesus and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, right? Mm -hmm. This was actual warfare. To the point where Satan now could no longer be there. And so he was cast out. Now, did he leave on his own accord? No. Hence the Bible says he was cast out, meaning he had to leave. He was thrown out of heaven by force. So, what Jesus did for us, what he suffered for us, how he learned obedience, he set an example and he laid the foundation for us. So it says, though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered, and being made perfect. Now let me ask you a question. Is this being made perfect a uh, start of a whole new sentence, or is it a continuation on from the last sentence? Now I am not an English scholar. You've heard me speak. It doesn't take long to figure that out. But you guys understand, is this a brand new thought, or is this a continuation of the same thought from that last sentence. I want you to understand what this says. Though he were a son, yet he learned obedience by the things which he suffered. What is these two things right here? What does a semicolon in our language mean? The end of a pause. It's not a period. A period would be the end of that sentence and beginning of another one. This thing means that whatever's coming next has everything to do with what was just said. Okay? And being made perfect, how was he made perfect? By what you see was written in verse 8. Not being made perfect because he was born the Son of God. Who was his mother? Mary. Was she perfect? No. So, when you come to Jesus, he got his divine nature in his incarnation. He got his divine nature from who? And so, what did Mary bring to this? So where did he get where did he get his human nature from? Okay, so it's not hard to figure out what kind of human nature he had. He had his divine nature from his father. The human nature came from his mother. What kind of human nature did she have? So okay, so this helps you to understand why, if Jesus had just a divine nature, or if he had an unfallen human nature. Why would he have to learn obedience? And why would he have to suffer to learn obedience? Hold on to that thought, right? And being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Does it say believe him? <laughs> right? What does it say? Obey. Now, that is a very specific choice word that Paul, or whoever was the, the writer of Hebrews, which we believe to be Paul, chose. Okay? Eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Call of God a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There is so much in just that one verse I've when it comes to that, theology. That obey, I've never seen that. Okay? Very good. I really rather have you see this part of that Jesus had to learn obedience. Amen. That he wasn't just put here and that the plan was made and that it was foreordained and there was no deviation from it. There was no way he could fail. I want you to see that when he lived his life and when he sacrificed, it was truly a sacrifice. He could have messed up. He took on human nature. He could have. He could have said no. Right? Now, listen to this. When I tell you he could have messed up, I'm not telling you he could have sinned. I'm telling you he could have changed his mind. 
Because the difference between you and Jesus is that he had no propensity to sin. Amen. He took on his mother's nature, but it wasn't some deep, dark evil that was inside of him. He had no propensity to sin. That's where he uh, has his connection to the first Adam. When Adam was born, or excuse me, excuse me when he was created, was he created with the propensity to sin? Well, no. no. And this is why Jesus is the second Adam. But he had a fallen nature because he took every weakness that humanity had taken on itself from sin, from the fall of Adam until his birth. Okay? Every evil tendency was all in him. Okay? Now, how many of you guys are repulsed by evil? Raise your hand. But yet, if it's an evil that you like and your flesh loves, you're not repulsed by it. <laughs> think about that. But think about what it was like for Jesus, who had to live in this dark world, and yet he did not, he did not chase people away. People were actually attracted to him. That's how you know a true follower of Jesus Christ. If your obedience and your righteousness causes people to flee from your presence, you can pretty much guess that it is self-righteousness and you're under works instead of under grace. Right? Because Jesus, the only people that Jesus actually repulsed were legalists. Were those that were self-righteous, hypocrites. Right? But the sinner, they were attracted to him. So as you live your life as Adventists, and you try to be lights in a dark world, you have to be a light that is loving and attractive. Yes, Max? I kind of liken it, and I've heard this before, a flashlight versus a lighthouse. <laughs> it's both light, but one goes right in your face, and the other one guides you off the rocks. I like that. I like that. So listen, and I'm going to close right now. Uh, what kind of light are you? Are you a light that attracts, or are you a light that repulses? When you live your life, and you witness for Christ, if you witness for Christ, is it a witness that draws people in, or chases them in? Are you condemning, or receiving? What does Christ call you for? Closing in this morning is hymn number 294.